This is the official Winning Time podcast from HBO, Hyperobject Industries, and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Rodney Barnes. I want to build something special. The Los Angeles Lakers select. The entire league is on the verge of bankruptcy. Irvin. For me, it's going to be exciting. Magic. Our girls. They won't cheer. They'll dance. Johnson. It's showtime. This week, I'm talking with Adrian Brody about playing Pat Riley. Then I get into some stories from the writer's room with associate producer and writer Rebecca Bertucci. But first, let's rewind the tape on episode eight. It's been a while since Jerry Buss opened an episode on a high note, but this week, he's all smiles. And that's because winning cures all. For now. This is the newest dynasty right here. My, my, us. It's officially the 1980s. The Lakers are on a hot streak, and the form is the hottest place to be. And the Lakers notch win 40 of the year in record time, now 22 and 5. Paul Westhead and Pat Riley coached the team to over 30 wins and have put together their signature on the Jack McKinney up-tempo offense. And speaking of Jack, he's back, sort of. Y'all can spry. Tell it to my doctors. Meanwhile, Mama Bus is out of the hospital, but she is not long for this world. When she drops that hard truth on Jeannie, she adds that she can't tell her dad. Gerald doesn't know. And that's precisely the way we need to keep it. Do you understand? Then we get to the NBA All-Star Game. While Magic is turning up the charm with the NBA brass, Cookie finds out that her friend is having Magic's baby. You want that? I, I was being polite. Were you polite enough to wear rubber? By the end of the episode, Magic gets advice on women from Dr. J. And as for Jerry Buss, well, let's just say that his grief over his mom shows us a side of him that's pretty creepy. My first guest is Academy Award winning actor and the cast member who I voted as the sexiest cast member <laughs> of the winning time cast crew. My friend, my man, A.B. Adrian Brody. Adrian, thank hey. you. Welcome to the show. Thank you, my man. Thank you so much. So let's start off with talking about your relationship with uh, Pat Riley. When did he come into the orbit, your orbit as a fan, as a coach, all of that? Yeah, that's great. You know, I. it's funny. When I think back about watching games as a as a boy, I remember Pat Riley. <laughs> and I, I don't remember other coaches, really, you know, and I, I don't, I didn't, you know, I, and I, I've, I've always loved the game, but I didn't have that kind of a connection to it when I was young, where I would be really studying, m remembering, having this kind of indelible impression of a coach. And, and he's always struck me. I can't tell you when that first happened, but right. it definitely would have been while he was coaching the Lakers, it was well mm -hmm. before he, you know, he was in New York with the Knicks, but um, I, I, there was just something about him that the way he carried himself, the way he exuded this, you know, he seemed like an iconic coach. Right. And uh, yeah, I really, uh, I always remembered that. That's why I was so surprised. <laughs> yeah, we're getting <laughs> to that. Got, we're getting to that. No, I don't, don't want to jump the gun. No, 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 no. We but he, it's, it's an amazing thing. It, it, it is an amazing transformation. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, let's yeah. use that as our segue to uh -huh. the world knowing Pat Riley as you just teed him up as, like, the sexy coats, the Armani suits, the slick back hair, and all of that. In our mm -hmm. series, this isn't where we meet Pat Riley. Can you talk about, I already know the answer to this. Can you talk about where we meet Pat and how you connect with where we meet Pat at the beginning of this journey in our series? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, it's a very relatable time and theme. But, you know, Pat Riley's transition from ball player, you know, playing, playing, you know, spending most of his life as a player and then, you know, being retired, um, I think was a really challenging phase. And I, I can relate to that. I understand, you know, we all go through transitions in our lives and, and um, you know, I think what was hard to, to grasp for him was that, you know, this, this is, 
what he had dedicated his life to and and he knew he had so much to give to the game and you know as an athlete you are you are kind of forced into retirement at a certain point and, and you're a young man and right. so he still still was yearning for that and things weren't aligning for him you know and, and it's a difficult time in in someone's life especially if you've been treated with a degree of uh if had a degree of success and earn some respect as a player or whatever your profession is to then kind of somewhat be on the out. And, uh, you know, this, that transition for him, I know was very, very challenging. And it was the beginning of finding his way back into the game and becoming the man that we all know and respect and admire. So, how do you as an actor get yourself in the emotional mindset of that kind of character beginning at a place where the world doesn't know this guy what happens within you to get you to this place other than being one of the greatest actors of all time <laughs> well <laughs> i you know what i could relate to very clearly was this sense of understanding of the game, so to speak, and what I so desperately want to contribute right. and am capable of offering. Mm -hmm. And um, windows of that not necessarily opening. And that's where he was at. And, uh, and you know, we have the privilege of knowing it's interesting for me as an actor too to play a character that I I know where he gets and 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 that's like having faith. <laughs> it's like yeah. you you know we don't know what's ahead of us. If we knew, we 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 might not get out of bed in the morning. This but is true. You know we might be inspired and and have a bit more uh, self belief and and patience with. Uh, confidence what seems like you know and endless uh you know uh adversity right and you know he's someone who really represents that to me and and by knowing both sides of the coin i, I personally and in in a depiction of him it's it's something that you know i i you know it's perspective and uh i think it's a it's an interesting thing to portray both as, as an actor and, a, and as a person to kind of remain uh, aware of those emotions and, and keep a healthy respect for, you know, the good fortune that you do have in, in those moments. What do you think the turning point for Pat is, our Pat in the show? Mm -hmm. um, you know, from where we start with him not being allowed into the forum to, you know, ultimately where we are at the end of the season. What do you think that turning point was? I think once he starts getting a bit of access when he's assisting Westhead, there is a pivotal moment where he refuses to relinquish their position as coach and interim coach and assistant coach. Right. And he fights for that. And he makes Westhead fight for that. Temporary's the first fucking month. Two, maybe. We coach 50 games. 50. You. Still his team. Not anymore. It's your team. It's ours. That's a real distinct moment uh, and a sense of, um, you know, strength and self-preservation. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it's a, it's a, a leadership, a leader, a quality of a leader, right? And, um, you know, he is doing this partially for his own benefit, but he's also making Westhead step up and represent the team and do what's best for the team so that everybody is, has the, their fair shot. And I believe that he firmly believes that they are the answer in that moment. You know, there were, there were terrible, un, un, terribly unfortunate circumstances that happened to McKinney and, and, uh, but in that moment, that was an opportunity, and and the game is about winning, 
and seizing opportunity. And, and he is someone who took that. Do you think the physical transformation, the mustache going away, the hair getting a little slicker, do you think that helps with the idea of where we're going with Rod? Did it help for you in that direction, going in that direction? Oh, it de- yeah, it definitely helps, and it has a bearing. I mean, like I said, this has been um, – it's a slow burn. <laughs> yes. Kinda, yes, it is. You know, you know and, and he's, he's still not – at that place. Right. So he's still yearning to find it, but he's well on the path. You see it and coming. You see it happening. Yeah, you definitely see it coming. And yeah. you see you see the man becoming the man he wants to be and and putting his foot down and uh so it's very exciting. It's a very exciting space to be in. Um but I I, I honestly can't wait to um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I little, promise you, little more to, yeah. it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> and you <laughs> see the authoritative way, like when he was dealing with uh, Spencer Haywood. We can't make it all the way without what you give this team. You putting in the dirty work, coming off the bench. I know that's not what you want to be doing here, but we need that from you right now. And we need you healthy so we can get you one of these. Yeah, it ain't no thing without the ring. <laughs> So I want you to talk to Kern and get that knee evaluated. You know, you see him talking in a way that's authoritative, and he begins to see a path for himself. No, and when you see him talk, I mean, if, if uh, as you look at any interviews with Pat Riley or whatever, he carries himself with a, with a he's got a wonderful, clear, determined um, demeanor. Yes. And, and he speaks eloquently and with, you know, great inspirational uh, anecdotes, and um, you know, it's a it's a remarkable thing. So he he's capable of speaking with authority, and and through this season, we watch him start to find that strength within him. So you spend a lot of time with, uh, or our Pat Riley spends a lot of time with our Paul Westhead. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like spending that much time with Jason Siegel? Did you enjoy it? How was it? <laughs> I, did, I, I, How, I, was you know, it? I love Jason, actually. He's, <laughs> he's so fun to work with. You know, sometimes you're on this journey and you, 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 you working closely with an actor and, uh, you know, sometimes there isn't, uh, it's not as easy to gel, right? The chemistry. It's just that that yeah. chemistry is not there. Yeah. And that's, that's where you have to, you know, work harder and and find ways of of working against those obstacles that's that's part of the responsibility but when you have somebody like jason who is committed to the work has a wonderful lightness about himself yeah and that elevates everything you know that gives you a, a playfulness and a freedom to experiment and and you know so that's been really fun and you know i, I love the dynamic of of the two of them in this kind of corner, you know, this, this, this uh, sharing an office and trying to find their way, you yes. know, through, through the ranks and, and the, the disbelief and the excitement and then the, the sense of uh, commitment that, that comes from all of them. It's, it's really, it's really fun. We had our shot. Oh, it was, shit. it was great. I fucking loved it. I'm not about to steal his. I don't be a Here's pussy. It. You didn't put him on that fucking bike. Just Paul. let me fucking pee no. in peace. Not until I hear you say it. Jesus for Christ's sake. Not until you say the fucking truth that you want this thing. You want this thing as much as I do. It's not about that. Yes, it is. He's like a brother to me. Well, then he'll understand. What do you think he thinks going forward as Pat Riley? What do you think he sees his role as being? I think he's not he's not really sure. I think it's left pretty unclear that you know, but he's he's coming back strong is what I would think, you know. He's going to mm-hmm. push forward and you know, I, it's exciting. I feel like he somehow knows what's coming in a way. Does that make sense? It does. Like I yeah. I feel like there is for someone to to have this much greatness and to have have made this much of an impact on the sport. And to come from a place where it was so precarious, where he could have easily given up, 
and just done something else. Yeah. Easily. Easily. And it was close. It was actually and close so to close. doing that. Yeah. It was close, exactly. And I think when that realization hits you of the potential uh, and that it was almost stripped away, mm-hmm. you you don't play any games. Right. And I know that feeling and I relate to that. And it's about it's about really being the best you can be and not worrying about anything else. These are the grounds that he learned that and earned that. You know, he writes about focusing on to be rather than to have. You know, he talks about all these guys that when they've made it, you know, they've got their fancy homes and fly rides and all the nice clothes and everything and more money than they need. And really, at the end of the day, aside having comfort and getting past the fear of not having, you know, food and shelter to cover that, the rest of that, it's not building much. Right. And what is building it is living the life that you know you should be living. Mm -hmm. And if you're dedicated to a profession or a craft to devote what you can to being the best you can be and to offer that. Well, Adrian, I love you. It's an honor being able to work with you, man. I really, really, really appreciate you and everything you bring. Um, Truly, truly an honor. And I appreciate you doing this with us today. Um, Thank you. Yeah, man, I appreciate you very much. Thank you very much for having me on the show. And uh, it's been fun. Thank you, bro. All right, brother. Talk soon. All right. Be well. All right. My next guest is associate producer and writer, Rebecca Bertuch. <laughs> Why you but, make that face? Because I haven't <laughs> seen you in a long time. I miss you. A little bit about Rebecca from my point of view. I'm going to oh, let Rebecca no. introduce herself. Oh, brother. <laughs> so how would you describe your role on the show? I know I have. I know what I think your role is on the show. Um, my role in the show, I mean... I've had the the opportunity to be here kind of from the beginning with you guys, and I've worked my way up, and you guys have been really supportive. I started as assistant, and then writer's assistant, and then researcher, um, and I think I've been able to find my voice in the room with you guys and talk about, I mean, it's a show in a lot of ways about masculinity, and um, for our female characters, that's uh, complicated because they're either being terraformed into some kind of mother figure or sexualized or invisible. And all of these women are trying to elbow their way into a world that is inhospitable to them. And um, I like to think I've been able to speak to that a little bit in my experience and give you guys a little bit of the uh, feminine perspective. Can you talk about a day in the life of Rebecca in regards to the show? Now, I know it's different for, like, Mm -hmm. when we're in Mm pre-production versus when we're in production. So you can choose whether or not you want to talk about one or the other. Mm. So when we were in the pandemic and we were writing, I think something that I found really helpful for me and something that was cool for us was that, like, you guys had already read, what, like, 60 books? 70 books, I want to say. A lot of books. A lot of books. Um, So we would go through and find just like thousands of articles. And I think that really helped inform and kind of like fill the gaps between those books. And we could read between the lines there. Um, And then uh, when we're in the writer's room, I'm mostly just trying to figure out how to (laughs) condense my pitches down so they're (laughs) tight enough that I don't lose anybody. And then... um, in uh, production, I felt like I was just trying to be a, a third arm for Max and for you and to be able to articulate your guys's vision where it needed to be said and um, help make that all run as smoothly as possible. So, episode eight, mm-hmm. what we're here to discuss. Um, were there any scenes that jumped out to you, anything that just tickled your fancy that you just can't <laughs> wait to talk about scene-wise? Um, I think in terms of like a 
big character moments and turning points, the fight between Cookie and Magic in mm. the hotel, that's a big moment for them. And for Cookie as a character, too. And I think seeing them be so raw and real with one another. I mean, it's an amazing performance by both of them. I remember being on set for that one, and we were just, like, blown away by where they were able to go with it. Okay, okay. All right, we did our thing. But but you was the one who said you had something else to do. She's happy, yo, baby. Nah, nah. Nah, Cook, that ain't true. Come on, that ain't true. She lying. Cook, you know that ain't true. Dr. Day warned me about all this shit. Once you got money, people got a target on your back. Come on, you don't believe she that. She is my friend. I see her at church, at school. When we were approaching Cookie and Magic's relationship, um, you know, obviously they've both written books. Magic has a couple books. She's got one. Um, and so a lot of it we were reading their two very, sometimes very different uh, perspectives on each other. And they're, especially in these early years, how they saw each other and how their relationship went. There's a lot of ups and downs. They're so united and they're this famous perfect couple now. But to see that they were just kids thrown into this spotlight, this really intense position and trying to make their way with very little like support tools, uh, to see them have to kind of scrap that out with one another and be imperfect, I think is a really moving, beautiful love story. And it was something that you guys always talked about building over time and seeing those ups and downs and riding it with them. Um, I think this question that Cookie, as the character, as we see it, is always asking is like, where do I fit in with this life? And it's something that we were always thinking about too. What is it about this connection that the two of them have that keeps bringing them back to each other again and again over years and years before they finally get married. I think for me, um, related to but not directly connected to the scene, just talking about black men and sexuality in general mm -hmm. and how we sort of dealt with that issue in regards to um, the players and magic in particular because mm -hmm. we lean on him a lot in regards to his sexuality, uh, to me what was important was not sort of labeling all black men as being one thing. Yeah. That we actually got into a little bit of the psychology of what we researched as to how his mind worked based mm -hmm. upon the character that we created because mm -hmm. we don't know the real guy. And that we were responsible in how we dealt with it in a realistic way. Yeah. So one scene that stuck out, the ending of episode eight. Mm. You know, we holed up in a place just like this when we first got here, Ma and me. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's gonna die. Can you talk about the creepy side of Jerry <laughs> Bus? How did that feel to you, Rebecca? I, this is one of my favorite scenes in the entire series. I know, I'm so fucked up, but I love it. I think that there's, because I think um, Jerry Buss's relationship with women is a very complicated, nuanced thing to approach because it says so much about him, how he sees the people around him and makes them useful to him in different ways. Like he sees people as, uh, I don't know, he sees women as either kind of like mom or person I want to have sex with. And sometimes that overlaps in a way that is twisted and uh, also kind of understandable. It's it's a moment of vulnerability for him that we don't often get to see. We see him always kind of hustling, trying, being a little bit performative. And, I mean, John's performance in that scene and Natalia's performance, they're, they're, um, it feels so raw and intimate. And vulnerable. And very vulnerable. And and so for me, like, I actually, it makes me feel a weird kind of empathy for him that he's kind of desperate for absolution, connection, and a feeling of safety. And to me, to escape the moment. He doesn't yeah. want to feel the real stuff. Mm -hmm. So he has to find some place to hide. Oh, yeah. And she is the perfect place to hide <laughs> in that moment. Yeah. And um, I think it's a... It's a way of connecting for us, this character, because it is a character of a person who's real, but it's a character 
and how he can have such, um, he does have all these powerful women in his life, his mother, Claire, um, that he leans on for emotional support and for business uh, advice. Um, and then to square that with his uh, having a different 18-year-old on his arm at all times, I think that this is this the, kind of the first moment where that starts to crystallize of why he's always got the young girls around him and what comfort he's trying to seek. So I've said to you on a number of occasions that um, one day you're going to be running Hollywood. Oh, my God. And I'm going to be asking you for a job. <laughs> Heard you tell a couple people that? <laughs> I have. I'm told I'm told that's a few a, people that's one of you're your going favorites. to be you're gonna be running Hollywood. You're just covering your bases so that you can It's uh... gonna be like, you know, you have Tyler Perry presents, uh-huh. it's gonna be Rebecca Bertucci's Hollywood. Are you saying I could play Medea? Uh no. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is if a young person, someone your age, mm-hmm. because I see you as young, Ugh. comparatively speaking, if they were coming into Hollywood um, sort of like thrown into the fire as you were. Mm-hmm. What advice would you have to give to that person? Um, know what you don't know. Uh, that's for sure the most important thing, I think. And then say yes and figure out logistics later. Ah. Say yes to the opportunity. Say yes to figure, like someone asked something of you and then figure out how you got to get that done. That's secondary. Rebecca, <laughs> thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank, thank you for, for talking to me. me. It's that time again, but before the time expires, I want to make a personal plea. This week's buzzer beater is selfishly all about me. I don't care if y'all get mad or, you know, you wanted to learn something that you didn't learn before or something like that. This is about me, so I'm going to be selfish. In episode eight, we meet the legendary Julius Dr. J. Irving. Doc! I told you last time my friends called me Julius. We might as well be friendly. Everybody's saying you the next me. Nah, man, (laughs) never that. You see, I happen to be the biggest, literally and figuratively, Dr. J fan. Still to this day, he's one of my basketball heroes. I remember growing up in Annapolis, Maryland, idolizing the man's game, style, and charisma. And I wasn't the only one. Even Michael Jeffrey Jordan isn't shy about his love for the great doctor himself. And this is a true story. When I was a kid, I remember traveling hours to a 76er game to get his autograph. When I finally got close enough to ask him, He reached out, he touched my hand, and said, not now, little brother. And I was a little, I I was angry, I was hurt, but he did touch my hand. So I was in a weird place, and his hands were sweaty, but I didn't get the autograph. So hopefully, Dr. J is a fan of the show, and he's a little empathetic uh, with the plight of a middle-aged, large black man who really loves him. But if I could just get the autograph and maybe a picture, um, my life would be complete. So come on, Doc. Help out a brother. Thanks for listening to the official Winning Time podcast. And a special thank you to our guests, Adrian Brody and Rebecca Bertucci. You can watch new episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max Sunday nights. Our next episode comes out May the 1st. See you then. This is the official Winning Time Companion podcast. And it's a production of HBO, Pineapple Street Studios, and Hyper Object Industries. Our executive producers are Harry Nelson, Claire Slaughter, Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna Weiss Berman. Our lead producer on the show is Jess Hackle. Aaron Kelly is our managing producer. Shaka Mali, Jonathan Shiflett, and Ellie Adler are our producers. Darby Maloney is our editor, and our engineers are Davey Sumner and Jason Richards. Production music is courtesy of HBO, and you can watch episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max. <laughs>